This is the Kershaw Junk Air Dog. I've had this for quite some time. Use it extensively, so much to the point that you can see that the edge bevel right here is now significantly wide and has intruded quite a ways up into the primary grind, uh, about 3 sixteenths of an inch wide. At that point, it's approaching the width almost of the common single bevel knives like Mora's, and it's getting the same problem they have that when you go to sharpen it, you have to remove metal along this great big wide strip of the edge so it slows down sharpening time. What I've done, um, partially already, and what I'll finish shortly to resolve that problem is to regrind it. There's the finished side reground. So you can see now the primary gravel goes straight down into the edge, which is less than five thousandths of an inch thick. And this very narrow edge bevel now will sharpen much faster, so the efficiency will be much higher. And one of the things I was thinking about while I was doing this is that the issues of this steel and the nonsensical way that it was used in this knife, and how that's often very common in the industry where steels used in knives don't seem to match the intention or purpose of the knives at all. Now if you look at this knife, you can obviously tell that it's sort of not meant to be a precision type cutter with a name like Junkyard Dog that doesn't scream out to you. Now it has a relatively decent handle in terms of shape ergonomics because it's sort of contoured and fits the hand all right. It's only a three finger grip unless you have really, really tiny hands. It doesn't have anything in the way of an index finger choil to speak of. So while it's obviously not made for precision type work because the initial grind left quite a heavy edge with quite a high angle, so it didn't cut particularly well, it's also not overly well suited for rougher type work because again it's only a small three fingered grip. But maybe you could argue, well, it's sort of a backup piece when you can't carry a full-size folding knife, and still, uh, we want to make it a bit rougher, and that's why it's, of course, it's solid metal handles. The odd thing about that, though, is that this steel, 13C26, very similar to AEBL, is not made to be a tough workhorse-type steel. It's a razor blade steel. It's made to achieve the highest hardness that you can get in a stainless steel, while still being having a high level of corrosion resistance. And that's due to the balance of carbon and chromium in the mix. Now you can increase those properties by other alloying elements, but for a basic carbon chromium steel, this is essentially your optimum mix. The problem is though, it's not very well suited for a rough use knife, because again, it's made to be a razor blade steel, so offer very high hardness. This can get up to 62 to 63 Rockwell on the edge. Uh, easily obtain 95% martensite formation with very small amounts of retained austenite, very tiny primary carbides, less than a micron, and no aggregate or clustering of the carbides to make it coarse. But that doesn't sound like what you would want in a rough user knife at all. The funny thing is, Sandvik, the company that makes this steel, also makes 12C27M. 12C27M has the hardness reduced slightly, over 13C26, but offers a much higher corrosion resistance, offers a much higher toughness, which is the steel that should have been used in this. The interesting thing is that they ran the steel in this, 13C26, to the same hardness that you would normally run 12C27M, so this steel ends up to be a horrible hodgepodge. You don't get the very crisp edge and high sharpness that you would expect from this. Instead, because the level of retained austenite is relatively high, you get a very gummy uh, type edge. And the funny thing was, a bit of a history on this. Before this came out, for about a year or a little bit longer, Roman Landis was on blade forms and a number of other forms, speaking about how blade steel should be chosen for knives. And his viewpoint was that knives should cut very well and be very sharp. Surprising thing. And he said, for those steels, you want the same properties in a stainless steel as you would in a non-stainless steel. So when you looked at steels that performed very well that were non-stainless, it was like 1084, 52100, the common steels that the guys at Forge Knives use. But when you jumped over to stainless steels, all of a sudden you looked at steels like ATS-34, which has nothing in common with a steel like 1084. ATS-34 has very chunky carbides. The steel structure is very coarse. So Roman was arguing that why not use the same stainless steels, which has the same properties as the non-stainless steels, because you can get very similar, he said. And then he argued a bit using the uh, testing that he had done. He's a materials engineer and also a knife maker. And he argued that AEBL, or 13C26, would be one of the best stainless steels for knives. Again, if you were looking at to try to minimize the edge geometry to provide maximum cutting ability, maximum sharpness, and maximum edge retention at high levels of sharpness. 
So when Kershaw came out using 13C26, myself and quite a number of other people were very excited because we were finally seeing stainless steels which acted like the non-stainless steels that a lot of people liked. And unfortunately, Kershaw butchered the production of this by running it much softer with much higher levels of retained austenite. So you ended up with an edge that was gummy, that was difficult to get very sharp, didn't hold that very high sharpness for any length of time, and it was just problematic. And of course, everyone then complained what was Roman babbling on about because this stainless steel doesn't act anything at all like he said it would, and is completely inferior to ATS-34. Yeah, it is, when you use it like this. That's one of the unfortunate pieces of history. Um, on this steel. This is a chef's knife, Chicago cutlery. It's made out of 420J2. 420J2 has almost no primary carbide. It's relatively limited in hardness though, so you won't see it get above 55 Rockwell very often. It's rather soft, but you will find it, when properly hardened, a pleasure to get to a very high sharpness. Very corrosion resistant and very tough. But because, again, the hardness is limited, uh, you'll usually find it between 50 and 55 Rockwell. You will notice a difference, of course, if you compare a knife in that range, 50 to 55, with a knife in a range 60 to 65. That's a relatively big jump, almost 10 Rockwell points. So holding a very, very high sharpness, you'll notice this knife doesn't do that well, but getting a very high sharpness is relatively easy, even with relatively common natural stones. This is uh, Santoku from Spyderco. This is made out of MBS-26, which is very similar to 19C27. 19C27 is the steel made by Sandvik that's a slight variant, you could say, of 13C26. So when you like the behavior of 13C26 in regards to the hardness, in regards to ease of sharpening, but you would like the ability to stay sharper at sort of a lower level of sharpness, a little longer, and you're not that concerned about corrosion resistance, 19C27 is meant to be an upgrade. So the primary carabides are a little bigger, but again, and you'll find it that it doesn't take that really high level of sharpness as easy as you would from, say, 420J2, or a properly hardened 13C26, or 1084, 52100, all properly hardened, is still relatively easy. And you'll see a big difference between, say, sharpening this and this, which is a very common steel, this is VG10. So when you jump all the way up to VG10, you now got a relatively coarse primary carbide structure. So when you're trying to get the edge to a very high level of sharpness, you'll find out that you need much higher quality stones. And you need to put a bit more effort into sharpening. Your stones have to be kept relatively flat. You gotta make sure they're not loaded. You have to do more steps when you're trying to minimize a burr with VG10. And after sharpening some VG10 blades, if you go back, to an MBS 26 blade, you'll find that it almost sharpens by accident. You really don't have to put that much effort into it. And then when you jump back to your 420J2 blades, you can see the same sort of increase again in terms of ease of sharpening. So the ideal way to think about 13C26, again, is it gives you that maximum hardness while still maintaining corrosion resistance and offers a very high ease of sharpening to a very high polish and maintaining that very high sharpness. But again, Kershaw dropped the ball on this and use the wrong steel for this knife and then harden it in a way to try to make up for the fact that they were using an incorrect steel. Odd choice, odd implementation, and unfortunate. I mean, if you took this knife, put 12C27M on it, you'd have a much tougher steel. You'd have a steel, and harden it properly, of course. You'd have a much tougher steel. You'd have a steel which was actually easier to grind in case it did get damaged, but it would take damage less. It would have a higher corrosion resistance, and it would be more sensible in terms of a rough use knife. But, unfortunately, choosing steels correctly for the implementation of the knife isn't as common as uh, you would actually like to see. Other than that, this is actually a relatively decent knife if you like all metal style construction, integral locks, and, you know, partial three finger grips. And it has one of the nicer clips that I've seen that's very comfortable in use. Because it's so wide, it doesn't have the very high contact points that a lot of clips get. Because, of course, they're very narrow, which means they generate a lot of pressure. This very wide clip, of course, spreads out the force, so the pressures are actually relatively low. And the curvature in the clip is very well designed to match the curvature naturally on the inside of your hands, because you can see the up and downs match this clip very well. Very nice execution of a clip. Very solid, you know, blade shape, nothing abnormal about that. And it's a flipper, but, of course, the action on this is not overly smooth. But this is a really... Uh, well-used work knife. So if I did take it apart on a regular basis and did clean it out and keep it properly lubricated, it probably would flip open, but 
as of now it's a bit gritty. So here's the knife as finished. It's ground on both sides. Now this looks like a continuous flat bevel from almost the spine right to edge. And this edge is now between two and four thousandths of an inch thick. It's very, very thin. It's not exactly a full flat ground bevel though. Now I've done full flat ground bevels in the past. The reason why I haven't done it here is because I do expect this is going to get a bit more rougher use. So I want to strengthen the edge bevel. So I started off with something that looked like this. So there's your standard typical knife. You can see here's your primary grind. You transition into your edge bevel. So you end up with this sort of dual tapered wedge. Now what I could have done, which I've done in the past, is simply shave off all this metal like this. Unfortunately, you gotta do it on a grinder because you can't really cut steel as easy as that. So you end up now with one smooth taper. So you no longer have the dual taper, you have one smooth taper. And all you do, of course, is just grind all that off. Problem is, though, that this very edge, when you grind it that thin, is susceptible to bending and cracking under lateral forces. You can even, you can even see it on the styrofoam. If I press on the styrofoam like this, it just compacts, it dents in. If you press it to the side, you can see it's much easier to deform laterally. And of course, that's because when you're pressing straight against it, you have to push back all of the styrofoam underneath it. When you push it to the side, you only have to push that little tiny bit at the side, and you can very trivially move that around, and of course, just crack pieces right out of it. By pushing it back in, it's very difficult to break it, even with styrofoam. So it's the bending of knife edges. So that, not really a great design when you're trying to make it more durable. So again, there's nothing wrong in general with doing a full grind from spine right to edge and just adding on a secondary edge bevel. However, I wanted to get maximize a bit more of the cutting ability durability ratio. And after doing a lot of work with larger knives of relatively high quality, here's an example of one. This is an Excalibur by Gavco. So what I had started doing was taking the primary grinds of these knives, bringing them down as close to the edge as I possibly could get until the edge failed, and then I was using that to sort of determine the maximum cutting ability. What I found though was that in general, that isn't the great way for the durability to be optimized. Instead, it's much better to have a transition bevel between the primary grind and the edge grind. And I found that that transition bevel provided a more optimal cutting ability durability ratio. And I've talked about that a bit more in the chopping blades, about the limit, where you start one grind, where do you go to the other, and the angles that I normally use. And I found now that that same concept holds over even to the smaller knives. So what I've done with the Junkyard Dog was instead of cutting off all of the metal, I cut off about most of it. So that looked like this. So it started off, you can see the very prominent secondary edge bevel. Well, I cut most of it off, but you can still see this, a little bit. And this was about, say, 25 thousandths of an inch thick. Then what I did was I made a convex bevel from this straight down to the edge at around 5 thousandths of an inch thick. Then I went back to the flat grind, and switching from flat to convex, ended up with what I wanted, which was a primary grind of about 4 degrees per side, which comes straight down almost right to the very edge around 15 thousandths then the angle increases from about 4 goes up to around 8 and then at that very very fine edge bevel it goes into your final edge transition and that little convex bevel between the primary and secondary grind significantly strengthens the edge by a number of factors one is the cross-sectional area just increases but the other one is convex bevels, because of the nature of actually being round, will tend to roll in a cut. A flat bevel can't. It very easily gets trapped. And when that flat edge easily gets trapped, it's prone to snapping and bending. So you can see, I can trap this flat edge here. If it was round, you can't as easily trap it. So there's a blow up of what the actual edge looks like, and it's this radius arc. So again, this is the bevel that I have in between the primary grind and the final edge bevel. So when you grab a hold of this, the bevel will naturally tend to want to rock out because it's round. You can rock it out of the cut. 
you don't get that same rocking on a flat bevel. It won't rock itself out, it just traps itself into cut. So even though this knife looks like it has a full flat grind from spine to edge, it doesn't. There's a flat grind from the spine that goes down around 15 down, that's 4 degrees per side. It then transitions into a convex bevel of about 8 degrees, which rounds to then produce a very fine secondary or edge bevel, which is between two and four thousandths of an inch thick. Now, you could argue that you could have done the exact same thing with a second flat bevel. So go from four degrees per side to around, say, eight degrees per side flat to around 12 degrees per side final, and you still get much of the same effect, and you do. You get the exact same effects I talked about before. The only advantage that adding a bit of curvature does in extreme situations when the edge cuts into something and you suddenly twist it, that bit of curvature, again, will allow the edge to sort of rock out of the cut rather than being trapped in the cut, like this one, which is fully straight, trapped in the cut and snapping off. Now, it's not 100% foolproof, doesn't make the knife infinitely durable, but again, that little bit of curvature allows the knife to rock a little bit and gives you a bit more durability.